Please take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading to 2 Kings chapter 2, please. 2 Kings chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 14 of 2 Kings chapter 2. We read the verses responsibly. We begin together on 1 and I'll read verse 2 and together on 3 and alternating like that till we end on verse number 14 of 2 Kings chapter 2. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. <clears throat> All of us standing please to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 1, 2 Kings chapter 2. Ready? And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, 
Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee, here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes, and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And let's end with 14 reading together also. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and smote the waters, and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also smitten the waters, They parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. And let's pray together. Father, add your blessing now to the reading of the Scripture here this morning. We thank you, Father, again for the Word of God, for not only inspiring your Word for us, but preserving it that we may hold copies in our hands this morning. And Lord, as we prepare our hearts to look at uh, this truth this morning, I pray that you would make each of us ready to receive your Word that we would all be ready to receive the word and mixed with faith so that it would profit those of us who hear, that our hearts would be good soil, that the word of God could fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives. So, Father, help us to listen today with the intent to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. So, bless the special to that end in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes does it seem too good to be true That God's only Son bled and died just for you Is it hard to believe that His love's really there When in spite of your sin, He continues to care? I don't know what a sinner you are but I know what a Savior He is. I don't know where your feet have taken you, but He's climbed up Calvary's hill. I don't know what kind of words you've spoken, but His words were, Father, forgive. I don't know what a sinner you are, but I know what a Savior He is. Sometimes does it seem you've wandered too far, you'll never get back to that place in His heart. Don't you know that He waits for the sound of your prayer? Just whisper His name 
and you'll find that he's there. I don't know what a sinner you are, but I know what a Savior he is. I don't know where your feet have taken you, but he's climbed up Calvary's hill. I don't know what kind of words you've spoken, but his words were, Father, forgive. I don't know what a sinner you are, but I know what a Savior he is. What we are is not what matters, but what he is through us. Who we are is not important, but who we choose to trust. I don't know what a sinner you are, but I know what a Savior he is. I don't know where your feet have taken you, but he's climbed up Calvary's hill. I don't know what kind of words you've spoken, but his words were, Father, forgive. I don't know what a sinner you are, but I know what a Savior he is. Good. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer today. We thank you, Lord, for being a great God to us and for so loving us that you would give your only begotten Son to come and to live a perfect sinless life and then willingly lay down his life on the cross to pay the wages of our sin. Lord, we realize that it does not matter the sin we've committed. All that matters is what the Savior has done for us. Thank you that he is the Savior of all men and that you're not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance and that you would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, Lord, I ask you to help me this morning as I bring the message today. I'm asking for help for each of the individuals that sit here this morning, those who might be watching by way of the Internet, that, Lord, you'll minister to our hearts today and help us to, to grasp hold of the truth that is contained in your word here. And Lord, I pray that your will will be done in each and every life. Help me to be clear and help me to be concise. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The, the Christian life is, is really, you have an Old Testament example, an Old Testament illustration, if you will, of salvation all the way to victorious Christian living in the children of Israel. And when I say the children of Israel, it's the people of Israel, the Israelites. You know, one little kid, you know, looked at his parents one day and he said, he keeps talking about the children of Israel. Didn't the grown-ups ever do anything? And uh, it, it's not the children of Israel, but it was the people of Israel. And, uh, for instance, when they were in Egypt, they were in bondage to Egypt. We know that Egypt in the Bible is a picture of the world. We're in bondage to the world and bondage to sin. How's the only way they got out of Egypt was by the blood of the lamb, the lamb on the doorpost. And when the death angel came and he saw the blood... He would pass over them. Of course, the death of the firstborn came, God's judgment on them, and of course, they got out of Egypt with the blood of the Lamb. That's a picture of us. The only way you get out of the slavery of sin and the only way you get out from underneath the curse of sin and the bondage to the things of the world is through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanses us from all sin. Now, they go out and they begin to be led by God. How? By pillar of fire by night? Pillar of cloud by day? And God, God is leading them. Where is God leading them to? The promised land. Okay? The promised land. And so they're, they're being led there. 
They get almost to the promised land. They're in a place called Kadesh Barnea. It's right across the Jordan from the promised land. And they decide we're going to send in spies to check it out. You know the story. And, and the 12 spies came back and 10 of them said, Whoa, fellas, there's big people over there. Now, yeah, it's a land that flows with milk and honey, man. There's one, and they brought back grapes that were huge and all kinds of good fruit to eat. But they said, man, there's giants over there. And they aren't from San Francisco. And uh, they, these guys are big. And uh, we, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. Only two men, who were they? Joshua and Caleb said, we can take this. God has given us that land. Let's go possess it. And of course, you know, they believed the ten. They didn't believe the two. And so by, by getting right to the edge, right to where they were going to possess all that God wanted them to possess, and they turned back. And for the next 40 years, you know what they did? All they did was go in circles until all those guys who were 20 years old and upward died. Uh, someone said they averaged uh, somewhere around uh, 8 to 10 or so funerals every day. These guys dying off at that kind of a rate to die off that many people. And they just went in circles. But you know what? A lot of people, their Christian life is like that. They just feel like they're going in circles. Oh, they've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. They have asked Christ to be their Savior. But they haven't got to the promised land. The promised land isn't heaven. The promised land is a victorious Christian life. Where, where See, in the, in the promised land, they fought battles. There were enemies there and they had to fight those battles, but they won the battles. The victorious Christian life isn't where you don't have any battles, it's where you win the battles. Within where you don't have any temptation, but you have victory over the temptations. And so that's where God would get us to be. Now, the, all that is a framework for what we just read this morning. All right? And I want you to follow along carefully. The Christian life, as you, as you go from being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb heading to the victorious Christian life, there are many temptations that a Christian faces. But let me tell you the biggest one you face. And that is satisfaction. You face the temptation of becoming satisfied as a Christian. Being satisfied with where you are. Satisfaction is this, the state of mind which results from the full gratification of desire. It's, it's, it's the repose of mind with the present possession and enjoyment. It really comes from a word that means to make enough. In other words, I'm satisfied. I'm happy with where I am. We're going to come to that. Understand, spiritual satisfaction will lead you to spiritual poverty. Spiritual satisfaction will lead you to spiritual poverty. You, you become spiritually complacent and you no longer strive for the kingdom of God. You no longer press on towards the mark. You're just satisfied. It will lead to spiritual paralysis. Your soul atrophies and becomes useless. It's a spiritual satisfaction is a vice that we must fight every day of our life. That we're good enough. I want to remind you that the spiritual journey we're on is a journey, it's not an arrival. You never arrive in your Christian life. Paul said, not to think that I have attained. I haven't already arrived. I'm not and I figure if the Apostle Paul hadn't arrived yet, maybe I haven't either. And maybe you haven't either. There's people over the years who could have done great things for God but never did because they became satisfied. In the text where you, we read this morning in 2 Kings chapter 2, Elijah is going to be taken to heaven. And he's accompanied by his servant and his successor, Elisha. Very from similar sounding names. Elijah with a J and Elisha with an S-H. And so you have to kind of listen carefully and, and keep them straight as you go through the story. But Elijah is going to test Elisha. And he's testing him about 
this area of what will he be satisfied with. Now he's been anointed, and, and from what I can read and study, they've been together for about eight years. From the time that Elijah went to where Elisha was a farmer, and he, and he by under God's orders, anointed him to, to be the prophet in his room, and Elisha, the farm boy, uh, took the oxen that he plowed the field with and the yoke and all the wood and ma- made that for the, make the fire for the burnt offering and he burned it all. What was he saying? I'm never coming back to being a farmer again. Why? Because no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Once you know what God wants you to do and you know that God has called you to do something, but you put your, your heart and your soul and your face to do it and you don't look back. You don't have a plan B. You don't. He burned the bridge, so to speak. And he follows Elijah. And so now, Elijah is going to test him. He's going to test Elisha's resolve. He's going to try to get him to stop. He's going to try and get him to stay behind. He's going to try and get him to settle down. But Elisha, as we'll find out, would not quit. Let's look at the, how it unfolds in 2 Kings chapter 2. The Bible says it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. The first place they come to, the first place you can get satisfied is at Gilgal. Gilgal was the beginning place. It's the first city the Israelites came to when they crossed the Jordan River. The place is on the eastern border of Jericho. And they kept the Passover here. They instituted the Passover and kept it. They renewed their right of circumcision. That's why Gilgal means the rolling away. And they rolled away their reproach of Egyptian slavery. It was at Gilgal where they set up the twelve memorial stones. Uh, to remind them of God allowing them to cross the Jordan River. And the manna stopped at Gilgal. And they began to eat of the fruit of the promised land. And so, and, and they, he, what he's saying is, well, are you going to be satisfied with settling down at the beginning? There's a lot of Christians who get settled down just because they're saved. How many times have heard people say, well, I'm saved, that's all that matters. No, you've settled down at Gilgal. You've decided to be satisfied with just where you begin your Christian life. You're like the little child who fell out of bed. When he was asked by his mom why he fell out of bed, he said, I think I went to sleep too close where I got in. And a lot of, a lot of Christians get in trouble because they settle down and go to sleep too close to where they got in. And, and, and they never do go on to grow in their Christian life. Hold your finger in 2 Kings 2, or put a piece of paper there if you would, or a bookmark, and look at Hebrews chapter 5, would you please? The New Testament, the book of Hebrews chapter 5. Paul addresses some people here who fit this description in Hebrews chapter 5. He's talking to some people here in verse 11 of Hebrews 5. Paul said, of whom, talking about the called of God, he's really talking about Christ and after the order of Melchizedek. But verse 11, he says, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Paul said, man, I've got some things I'd love to teach you, but you're not ready to hear it. It doesn't make any sense to you. Why? Well, verse 12. For when for the time... Ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such, as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of a full age, even to those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. 
I'm saying, here, I'm talking to people. Paul says, you ought to be at the stage of your Christian life where you're able to teach others, and yet you have to be taught. You're at the stage of your Christian life when you ought to be bearing someone else's burdens, but you're actually a burden to somebody else. You're at the stage of your Christian life where you ought to be an example to others, but the truth is, you're always looking for someone else to try to be your example. You're, you're, not, you're, not, you're, you're just staying settled down right where you got saved, right where you got in, and you're satisfied with that. Don't stay at Gilgal. Don't tarry there. God did not save us just so we wouldn't go to hell. God didn't just save you so you'd miss hell and go to heaven. If that was the case, as soon as you're saved, God would just take us out. But He leaves us here. And He tells us that whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we are to all to the glory of God. Prior to salvation, all have sinned and come short of what? The glory of God. The Bible says that are in the flesh, meaning an unsaved person, cannot please God. There's nothing you can do as a lost person that pleases God. And so, I can't bring any glory to God as a lost person. Now that I'm saved, what am I saved for then? I'm saved for the glory of God. I'm to bring God glory with my life. And I'm not going to do that if I stay at Gilgal. So don't settle down. Don't get satisfied at Gilgal. Thank God Elisha, when he said, hey, you stay here, Elisha. Elisha said, no, as my soul lives and as your soul liveth, I'm going with you. And so they went on. Where's the next place they went to? Back to 2 Kings chapter 2, please. 2 Kings 2. So they went down to Bethel. Bethel. The sons of the prophets were at Bethel, came forth to Elisha, said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thee today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And again, Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, as I so liveth, I will not leave thee. Next thing they go to Bethel. Bethel, as some of you know, means house of God. It's the place of God. Will Elisha be satisfied at Bethel? You know what Bethel was? It was the house of God, but it was the place of dreams. Jacob's dream of the ladder and the angels ascending and descending on it, Jacob's ladder, that was at Bethel. That's where he dreamed that dream. And, and so he's wondering, Elisha, will you stop at dreamland? Will you stop here where dreams, where people are dreaming about what they'll do for God? And dreams are okay, and dreams are good if you'll do them. But a lot of people never get past the dream stage. All they want to talk about is what they're going to do for God. What ought to be done. What they dream of doing someday for God. Yeah, I, I know, I know, I, I see someday I'll, I'll be in church three times a week. Someday I'm going to be faithful to the Lord. Oh, you know that that's what you should do, but it's just a dream to you. You plan to someday, but I want to remind you, God does not bless our intentions. He blesses our actions. He blesses our actions. You know you ought to tithe and give the Lord what's His. You plan to someday. Someday. You know you could teach a class or sing in the choir or win others to Christ and serve God in some way, and you're going to do that someday. You have dreams about what you'll do someday. You settle down in Jericho, and all you're doing is dreaming of what you might do for God someday. Let me give you a formula. Dreams plus work equals reality. You've got to put work in there. 
So Elisha, to his credit, said, I'm not staying at Gilgal. I'm not staying where I got in. And I'm not staying where I'm just dreaming about what to do. Man, I'm going to be, hey, Elijah's leaving and I'm going to be Elijah. I'm going to be in his place. Pretty prestigious place to be. But he's not going to stop at dreaming about it. He said, I'm not stopping in that place. So he doesn't stop at Gilgal, the beginning. He doesn't stop at Bethel, the dreaming. Let's look at number three. Elijah, the end of verse 4 says, They came to Jericho. And then the sons of the prophets were at Jericho. And they came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And again Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee, here. For the Lord has sent me to, where church? Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they two went on. Now he tries to get him to settle at Jericho. I want you to stay here at Jericho. What was Jericho? Jericho was the place of past victories. It's the first real miraculous victory they had in the promised land. It was a city where Rahab lived, remember? And she lived on the wall, and the walls were huge, and had houses on it and everything, and, and, and they didn't know how they were going to defeat Jericho. And you remember the plan? Uh, you're going to march around it uh, one time a day for six days and then seven times on the seventh day. And then we'll pull out the heavy artillery and the airstrikes will come in. No, he didn't do any of that. You know what he said? Then, then you're all going to yell. The priests will blow the trumpets. And then all the walls will fall down flat. Really? Really? Is that what happened? That's what happened. It's exactly what happened. It was unbelievable. It was miraculous. It's one of those things, it, when you get to heaven, if there's, a, if there's a heavenly DVR that we can go back and watch things, that's one of the things I want to see. That would be incredible, to see the, the falling of Jericho there. And so, the, the, it was an amazing victory. And listen, listen, will Elisha stay and just dwell on past victories? Will he stay there at Jericho? You know, many Christians are happy to live there. Past blessings. They talk about the church they used to go to. They talk about the preacher they used to have. The revivals they used to see. The class they used to teach. The visits they used to make. The choir they used to sing in. Everything they used to do for God. And I'm not telling you this morning to forget the past blessings. I think you should remember the past blessings. What I'm telling you this morning is don't live there. Don't live on the past blessings. Learn from them. Praise God for them. Grow by them. But don't live in them. That's what you used to do. You're living only on the past victories. You know what you want? You want some new victories for today. You want some new blessings for today. God, what are you doing today in my life? You know, Jericho was known as the city of palms. Jericho was Palm Springs. That was where everybody sat back and wore Bermuda shorts and played shuffleboard and talked about all the things they used to do for God. And reminisced about all the past victories. But they aren't doing anything for God now. Even the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians said, you know what I do? I forget those things that are behind. And by the way, Paul had not only, I'm sure, defeats and things he didn't want to remember, but he had victories. He had great successes, but he said, you know what? I have to put those behind me too. Why? So I'll press on toward the mark. If I don't put those behind me, I tend to just dwell on them. And all I ever talk about is what I used to do for God. There's a great host of Christians who sit in churches today and all they talk about is what they used to do. And they do nothing today for the Lord. It's not what you were or where you were yesterday, but where you are and what you're doing today that matters. Live for God today. Live today for His blessing. Will you stay at Gilgal? 
where you first got in. I'm saved, that's all that matters. Remember, those of you in the RU ministry, remember Brother Currington talking about that? He said when he first got saved, he was just, just there, but he said, you know what, as soon as I'd get upset or the boss would treat me wrong or something would go bad, he said I'd find myself right back in my addiction. Why? Because I, right, I was too close to where I got in. He said, so I had to, God had to continue to show me things that were wrong and I would take those steps to, to live that way. And what I'm doing is I'm getting further and further away from ever going back to where I was. <clears throat> Don't stop at Gilgal. Don't be satisfied at Gilgal. Don't be satisfied at Bethel and dreaming what you'll do for God. Don't be satisfied at Jericho where all you think about is your past blessings, what you used to do for God. Don't be a used to Christian. The next place they go, if you notice verse number 6, I will not leave thee. The Bible says the two went on. Verse 7, 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. The fourth thing, the fourth place you don't want to get satisfied is on the other side of Jordan. Now they got, they crossed Jordan. He smote the water with his mantle. It's his outer cape kind of thing, we would call it. And he hits the water, and boy, the water parts. Wouldn't you like to see that happen? I mean, it's pretty incredible. And they went through on dry ground. God, God doesn't just make it muddy, and you know, when the water just clears away, you got some mud issues. But God made it dry. God can do that. My God's big enough to do that. I hope yours is. And so they went over. And... They go to the other side of Jordan. You know, the other side of Jordan, and I'm going to develop this a little bit for you. Now they're on the side of the promised land. They're in the right side of the Jordan, we should say. But the truth is, this is where the Ammonites lived. Right across the Jordan. It's a world without God. It's a world that really we came from before we got saved. There's two types of Christians in the room this morning. There's those who live in the promised land. And they know, listen, we know we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And you know that. We know we live in this world. Can't get away from that until you go to heaven. But you don't have to be of the world. The other is what's called a carnal Christian. And though they're saved and they've crossed Jordan, they're still living like they're on the other side of Jordan. They're still living, in fact, even like they did when they were in Egypt. Living after salvation, like you lived prior to salvation, will destroy your life. And it will destroy people who look to you. If you remember, when Joshua led them across the Jordan into the Promised Land, and they were moving on to go towards Jericho, there were two and a half tribes that wanted to stay there, on that side Jordan. They didn't want to go on in to the promised land. They wanted to stay there on the other side of Jordan. Those, one of those tribes was a tribe named Gad, one of the twelve sons of Jacob. And they wanted to stay. Their reason was, we want to stay because it's good for our cattle here. Never, never giving any thought, is it good for our children to be here? 
Is it good for our family to be here? No, it's just good for our business. They forgot about their children. Go, go forward several hundred years, if not more. Jesus visits this area. You'll remember it. It was called the land of the gad Urines. The Gadites. There was a crazy man there. A demon-possessed man. Remember? And when, when the demons were cast out, they all went into a herd of... Yeah, herd of swine. And the people came out upset. What are they upset about? They lost their pigs. They're upset at the deviled ham <laughs> that, that, that they got now. They cared more about the pigs than they did a man who had his life changed by Jesus Christ. Where'd that start? That started all the way back here. When they made the decision, I don't want to go all the way in. I don't understand people who are satisfied with being less than all God wants them to be. I don't understand that. You, you ought, to, ought to be something in your heart and in your life that you desire to be everything that God wants you to be, to have everything that God wants you to have, to possess everything that God would want you to possess. To live in victory in the promised land. Elijah is testing Elisha. He's seeing his resolve. He's seeing what he's willing to be satisfied with. I love the fact Elijah, it's interesting, Elisha said, okay, ask what you want from me. And Elisha said, I pray thee a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And, and he said, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, he told him the condition that he could have that. And it's interesting, as I was studying this, the, the, the word portion there is, a, is, is that something that has to do with speech. He said, I want to I be able to have your spirit, but I want to be able to communicate it. And that makes kind of sense. You know, what was Elisha before Elijah anointed him to follow him in the office of a prophet? Elisha was a farm boy. And he probably thought, I can't talk like Elijah talks. I can't stand up in front of people. Number one fear people have is public speaking. Scares people to death. In fact, they fear that more than they fear dying. Some people say, I'd rather die before I stand up and talk in front of people. But you know, so he says, I want to I be able to communicate that spirit. I want God to use me in a great way. And I want you to notice... He sees Elijah go to heaven. Verse 11, Elijah is taken up by a whirlwind into heaven. There's only two men in the Bible that never died. It was Enoch, who was not, for God took him. And it was Elijah who went to heaven in a whirlwind. And the great news is here, verse 12, Elijah saw it. And he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And look at what he does. He takes hold of his own clothes and rents them, tears them in two pieces. He took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. He went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And what happened? When he had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither. And Elisha went over. And the sons of the prophets saw it in verse 15. Let me tell you, he wasn't satisfied at the River Jordan either. He wasn't just satisfied to see Elijah go in a whirlwind. He wasn't satisfied to see that 
God would do the miracle of Elijah hitting the water and the waters parting. He wasn't satisfied that he saw God continue to do miracles for Elijah. He wanted God to do something for him. He wanted God to do something great in his life and through his life. Let me ask you a question. Are you content to do little for God? Are you content for God just to do a little something with you or through you? Or would you like to see what God, would you like to see all that God could do with you and through you? These, you remember, when it comes to Elijah, when it comes to any of these people in the Bible, they were all people like you and me. That's why the Bible tells us about them, you know, uh, their flaws, their shortcomings, their tells it all. When Abraham Lincoln was having his portrait done, the man, he, he said, why don't you look and tell me what do you think so far? And he showed him his portrait and Abraham Lincoln had a wart on his nose. And the, the guy doing the portrait took it off. He chided the young man. He said, you paint my picture wart and all. You know what God did when he wrote the Bible? He wrote it warts and all. We see it. But why does that, how does that help us? Because we all got some warts. And we're thankful if God can use those men, He'll use us. If God will work through them, God will work through us. God will do something great in them and through them. God will do something great in you and through you. Don't be satisfied. John the Baptist started at Jordan. Naaman the lepers started at Jordan. Jesus began His public ministry at Jordan. But none of them stopped there. They continued on. If Jesus had stopped there, there'd be no Calvary. If Jesus had stopped there, there'd be no sacrifice for sin. If Jesus had stopped there, there'd be no salvation for you and me. There'd be no resurrected Christ. Jordan, a place of miracles. Jordan is a place of power. Jordan is a place of opportunity. But still, it's not a place to settle down. The principle is simply this. Don't be satisfied. Keep on going. Keep on pressing on for God. The man or woman that God uses is the one that keeps on going for Him. Stay here. As my soul liveth, as your soul liveth, I'm not leaving you. And they too went on. And they too went on. And they too went on. Over and over again, they just kept on going. Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho, the other side Jordan and Jordan. He pressed on for God. And by the way, You can count them up. He saw double the miracles that Elijah saw. Amazing ministry God gave Elisha. So what are we saying? The Christian life is a journey, not an arrival. You never arrive. You're on a journey. Keep pressing on. You have to press on, Sunday school teacher. You have to press on, children's church worker. You have to press on, are you worker? You have to press on, nursery worker. You have to press on, Bible club worker. You have to keep pressing on. It's a journey, not an arrival. Don't don't fall to the temptation of becoming satisfied. Remember, the songwriter said, so true, I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. If you just remember that as you press on in your Christian life, it's it's like going on an incline of a hill. And if you're in your car and you're going up the hill, what happens if you just let off the gas? You don't stay there. You begin to fall backwards. Anytime you let off the gas in your Christian life, you're going to go backwards. You're going to go backwards. Keep pressing on the upward way. Paul said, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God 
in Christ Jesus. Don't fall for the sin of being satisfied. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you for everyone's attention today. Lord, thank you for uh, Elisha. Thank you for the test that Elijah gave him. And yet, Lord, I, I, I love the zeal, the determination that you gave to Elisha to not be satisfied. And, and he wasn't even satisfied to have just equal of what Elisha did. He wanted a double portion. Ask for a double portion of the Spirit to be upon him. And Lord, I pray today there'd be something, and there'd be several someones in this room today that in their heart would be a passion. In their heart would be a great desire to possess all that you have for them. That they won't be satisfied at Gilgal. They won't be satisfied at Bethel. They won't be satisfied at Jericho and they won't be satisfied on the other side of Jordan. They won't even settle down at Jordan. But they'll continue to press on. Lord, remind us that none of us have arrived. David wrote in the Psalms, I'll be satisfied when I awake in thy life. God, help us never to be satisfied until we awake and we are like Jesus, for we shall see Him face to face. Until then, help us to press on and continue to strive each and every day and ask You to work in us and through us that which is pleasing in Your sight. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. But I wonder today, just between you and God, how many folks today would say, Pastor, you know, you talked about getting out of Egypt by the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb. They got out of Egypt on the doorpost, and of course, Jesus was our Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And Pastor, I know I'm saved. I know I've come out of Egypt my faith has been placed in Jesus Christ and I know my sins are forgiven. I know I'm on my way to heaven today. Here's my hand as a testimony. Is that you today? Would you slip your hand up? Say, Pastor, I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put it down. You here today would say, Pastor, I'm not sure. If I died, I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure that I've ever been set free from Egypt, set free from my sin by faith in Jesus Christ. But Pastor, I appreciate you praying for me. Would you slip your hand up and say, pray for me today, Pastor? That'd be me. Thank you. Thank you. wonder how many believers are here today and say, Pastor, I don't want to settle. I don't want to get satisfied. I don't want to become complacent in my Christian life. I really do want to press on to the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I don't want to think I've arrived. I don't want to, I don't want to be satisfied at Gilgal. I don't want to be satisfied with Bethel. I don't want to be satisfied with Jericho. I want to possess all the land that God has for me. I want to live in victory and I want to see God do all that He'd like to do in me and through me. Preacher, God spoke to my heart this morning. Pray for me today. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'm going to pray and we'll have our invitation. Listen carefully. If you're here today and you slipped your hand up and you said, you know, I'm just not sure that I have eternal life. I'm not sure that I'm going to heaven. When I'm done praying, we stand to our feet. The pianist plays. Brother Bob will sing. Just slip from your seat. Meet me here at the front. We'll have someone take a Bible, take you privately, and they'll show you how you can know for sure you have eternal life. Don't put that off. Do it today. If you're here and you're saved and you've never been scripturally baptized, you ought to come and say, Pastor, I need to be baptized. 
I'm saved, but I've not been obedient to the Lord in baptism. And I need to be baptized. Christian, if you just need to come this morning and pray, come and kneel before God. And ask Him that He which hath begun a good work in you would continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Bow your knee and tell Him to work in you and through you that which is pleasing in His sight that you never want to become satisfied. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts today. I pray you'll have your will and way now in this invitation. I would ask you, Lord, that each individual would do what you're bidding them to do in their heart. And Lord, that no one would resist you today and hold back. May your will be done in every heart and life is my prayer. And I'll thank you for it. 